Munib here. Uh, today we have David, founder of Skynet, and we're going to talk about the Stacks 2.0 launch and how with the launch, our developers would be able to actually work with Skynet. Hey, David. Hey, great to be here. I'm super excited for our new partnership with Stacks. We've been working very hard to build a decentralized cloud, and uh, it's amazing to me to see that opening up the, the horizons and, and that we can bring this to more communities. So I'm really looking forward to what people build uh, with Skynet, Stacks, and, and the new Clarity language. And I think, interestingly, this all started when uh, some of the, the developers in your ecosystem were using storage, but they were using authentication toolkit from our side. And we just put two and two together and started chatting more about how we can do like even uh, deeper integration, especially given smart contracts, clarity contracts that they're launching with Stacks 2.0. Yeah, one of our one of our best contributors um, in this kind of ecosystem is a huge fan of the Stacks ecosystem as well. Uh, so it's really cool to you know have something like this appear in such an organic way. Awesome. Well, we'll have more information uh, in, in a blog post, but awesome to have you here so that you know our community can directly hear from you. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, thank you for joining me. So my name is David Vork, and I'm here today to talk about uh, Skynet. And as a quick background on me, uh, I'm a cryptocurrency developer. I've been active in the space since 2011. Back, I believe that was pretty much pre-altcoin. I think it was just Bitcoin at the time. Um, and then got started with Saya in 2014, and that has evolved over time to Skynet, uh, what we call Skynet today. So. Uh, Quick overview of Skynet. It is a new platform for building decentralized web applications. Um, and so you can think of a traditional web application as something like Twitter, Snapchat, or Facebook, which is centralized. Um, and Skynet allows you to build the same things. Um, so you know, in, in theory, you can make a perfect clone to Twitter, except have it be completely decentralized. Um, and on Skynet, we achieve decentralization with a new data model that is user-oriented instead of corporation oriented. So basically uh, data, data is controlled and owned by the user and, and exists in user storage buckets rather than on corporate servers. Um, and then we've developed an SDK to help developers build new applications. So if, if you're looking to build something like an alternative to Twitter or an alternative to uh, say Snapchat, um, we have an SDK to help you and, and the platform's live today and, and all the fundamental features you need um, are ready to go. Um, so before I get too, too much deeper into Skynet, I wanna talk about uh, some of the challenges that we see with the internet today and kind of what, what we've pointed Skynet, uh, the problems that we've pointed at Skynet at solving. Um, so the biggest thing is just how much control uh, corporations have over the modern internet. Um, as especially over the past five years, um, we've seen groups like Facebook, um, YouTube, and Twitter increasingly uh, you know, do a power grab and grab more and more control, more and more data, more and more hostile terms of service. Um, and they start to build kind of like Instagram, these asymmetric power dynamics where uh, Facebook, the, the owner of Instagram, holds all of the cards. They, they control what users can see um, and, and how users access photos, and, and they really manage the entire ecosystem, uh, which leaves content creators in a, in a position of vulnerability. Um, so a huge aspect of this for us is the managed feeds. Um, so for example, like Twitter or YouTube or TikTok, um, users only have one option. There's there's one feed and that's the feed that the corporation gave you. And it's actually a, a common problem on YouTube where 
um, someone you're subscribed to and you've set up to receive notifications, they may publish videos that you never see because for whatever reason, the YouTube algorithm has decided not to present those videos to you. Um, and as the user, you have no control over this. What you see is entirely managed by corporations. Um, and, and these feeds are not designed for your well-being. These feeds are designed for bottom lines of corporations. They want to improve engagement um, and they want to improve, uh, I guess, vulnerability or malleability to marketing. They want, they want to drive ad dollars and, and clicks and spending behavior. Um, and so these feeds are actively uh, managed by the corporations kind of against the user's well-being. They're usually very addicting and very manipulative. Um, and so that, that's another thing where we, you know, a, a decentralized world can improve on this sort of situation. Um, another big challenge that's been in the news a ton um, with the recent events in US politics is deplatforming. Um, and while I don't wanna get political, I can talk about a much more longstanding issue, which is that of YouTube demonetization. So in, in the corporate internet, uh, a user can be kicked off a platform at any time for any reason. And oftentimes this reason is just a, an arbitrary change of, uh, change of terms of service. And so anyone who's deep into the YouTube world knows that it's a constant struggle for users, uh, for especially content creators to keep their videos uh, monetized and making money. And uh, you know, if, if there's a copyrighted soundtrack that played for too long in the background because you know someone walked by with a boombox, or um, you know, even even things like you swear too many times or you say the wrong words. Uh, I think for a while, anyone who mentioned COVID nineteen uh, had their video demonetized. And so you have these like arbitrary and oftentimes uh, just stubborn rules that deplatform users. And, and so we want to build an internet where someone with, you know, a content creator with a willing and engaged audience can guarantee uh, monetization. They can guarantee that they will continue to have access to, again, their willing audience, the audience that wants to be hearing from them. Um, and then finally, uh, I kind of touched on this earlier, but corporations have arbitrary control over their terms of service. And sometimes they make very broad sweeping changes um, that can be very destructive. Um, and so I think the biggest example of this in recent memory would be the Tumblr banning of NSFW content. There was a massive NSFW community on, uh, on Tumblr and, and lots, of, lots of different people who spent lots of time curating uh, feeds for their users. And, and one day Tumblr was just like, okay, that's no, no more of that at all. Um, and so even though, you know, users were given time to react and they weren't necessarily banned, um, in some sense, their way of life uh, just kind of disappeared under their feet. Um, again, for, for no reason other than, than Tumblr decided their, their bottom line would be better uh, with this rule change. So, um, and then the final thing I want to talk on is is fragmentation. This is something I think we don't appreciate how how much damage it does to the internet. But on the internet today, data is stuck in one place. If, if you post something to Facebook, if you upload an image to Facebook, that image is only on Facebook. You can't transplant it to uh, Snapchat easily, or you can't you can't use it in your blog. Um, and so, you know, the, the internet is broken up into a bunch of individual silos that are kind of at war with each other that don't want to share data. They want to lock users to the platform um, and they want to make sure that if you're part of a social network, say like a Facebook group, um, you are stuck on Facebook's platform. If you want to talk to your friends, your only option is Facebook. Um, and, and if you don't want to use Facebook, that's, you, you know, you can't, you can't be part of any of your groups anymore. And so we want to see data opened up. Um, and that's exactly what the user-owned data model of Skynet gives us. Um, so if we uh, kind of project forward, and, and so the technology is ready today, um, and there are some applications today, but if we project the applications forward and see you know, what, what can be built, we get to an internet where um, the users have everything. If you, if you upload data to a platform, 
you're not actually uploading it to a corporate server. You're putting it in a bucket that you control that kind of says, you know, this, this is Facebook data or this is Twitter data. Um, and that data can easily be transported between applications. You can pull it down at any time or, or make it available to another platform at any time because, again, it's not on Facebook servers. It's under your control. Um, and similarly, kind of a, a neat little side effect is that on Skynet, all the code is run client side, which means the user can choose any version of an application they want to use. If there's an update to an application that the user doesn't like, um, they can just elect to stay on the old application. Um, and so Skynet is very much about giving power to the user. Um, so when it comes to feeds, um, because the data is open and public and available to everyone, it's not only on Twitter's servers, that means that anyone can come in and make a feed algorithm. Anyone can come in and make a moderation algorithm. Anyone can determine you know, what, what videos are suitable to present to a user or not. And users can select between all of these feed algorithms. If you want a Twitter that's just purely timeline-based, the people that you follow and it, and it shows you the, you know, the order of the tweets chronologically, that's something that you can build. Or if you have some other idea for how tweets should be presented, the data is all open and available. Anyone can build any feed algorithm they want. And users can select different feed algorithms without having to completely move off of, say, the Twitter platform. Um, so it gives users significantly more flexibility. It also gives developers significantly more flexibility. Um, Probably the biggest advantage that people talk about today of decentralization is, is the stable platform. Um, you don't have this terms of service. You don't have arbitrary rules that can get you kicked off of, say, a decentralized Twitter. Um, there's no like surprise bannings and, and no demonetization. If you have something that works and an audience that likes it, um, that thing can be depended on to continue existing into the future. And that's something that the centralized internet just can't offer to content creators. And, and we see this as something uh, which is very important because increasingly, you know, I, th I think we're between 100,000 and a million people who make their entire income off of content creation. So uh, stable platform is something that, that we think is very important, but uh, shouldn't be lost or we don't wanna lose everything else. Um, so the, the final big thing is, is just the data collectivism. And I think this is going to take a long time to explore, but on Skynet, all data is available to all applications. Um, data is stored in a global layer and every application has both read access and write access to the, uh, to the raw data of every other application. And so what this means is that um, let's say you want to make an alternative to Facebook, your Facebook alternative can write into the same data, the same data bucket that Facebook uses to manage Facebook groups, which means to all your friends who haven't switched platforms with you, they will still think that you're a part of their group. You will see their messages, they will see your messages, and you can continue to collaborate. Um, and so essentially what it means is if you're building a new application on Skynet, the uh, default um, content, right? Uh, I, I'll switch back to the centralized world. If you make a new application in the centralized world, let's say a competitor to YouTube, day one, when you launch, you have zero videos, you have zero users, you have zero traction. It doesn't matter how amazing the application engine is. It doesn't matter how good the code is because there's nothing interesting on your platform yet. You have to start completely from scratch and build a brand new ecosystem. That's in the centralized world. In the Skynet world, you can launch a better application engine. And on day one, you have access to every single YouTube video that's ever been posted to Skynet. You have access to every single like. You have access to all the history. You have access to uh, you know, the full set of comments and, and the list of which users are subscribed to other users. And that means that on day one, you can provide an enormous high depth ecosystem for your users. You don't have to build that from scratch anymore. And I think that this is a big deal, especially for startups um, and startup founders, because it means that you can bring your interesting idea to life without having to go through 
uh, just the brutal struggle of building a network effect when the existing corporations are doing what they can to uh, crush that network effect. And so because of this, we kind of think of uh, Skynet's uh, as adding a new component to Metcalf's law, which is that as you add more users, the value of a network grows with the square. Um, but on Skynet, as you add more users, it grows with the square, not of the users on your app, it grows with the square of the, all the users on Skynet. Um, so it's, it's this much more powerful um, situation. So uh, I'm out of time. Um, I was gonna go over the Skynet architecture, but uh, instead I'm gonna answer a few questions that have popped up. So uh, the first question is, do you think privacy is enough to motivate the masses to move platforms? Um, and I think the answer is no. Uh, I think that really what's going to drive adoption on Skynet is the more powerful data model for developers. Um, I think developers are going to be very attracted to the idea that they can build their own version of YouTube and have all of YouTube's content without having to bootstrap from scratch. And I think that's going to make the ecosystem on Skynet a lot more um, just agile and flexible. And, and I think, you know, at scale, it's going to run circles around any centralized attempt to control the data. It's, it's just too powerful when the data is so open. Um, so uh, we have a quick question. What are the rails that Skynet uses? In short, uh, Skynet is built on top of the SIA blockchain. Um, there's a very important primitive called a file contract that we make use of. And then we have two more um, architectures that I can't go into today, uh, but one is called the IGDL, which is kind of like IPFS, but uh, with, the, with a decentralized storage backend rather than user seeded backend. Um, and then we have something called SkyDB, which is the IGDL, but it has um, mutability. Um, and so, so the IGDL is, is all content addressed and immutable and SkyDB can, is pub key based and users can push out new updates uh, under their public keys. So I think that's, that's about all the time I have. Um, I hope that you guys, oh no, I have, uh, I have one more announcement that we have to make, which is uh, a developer bounty um, between uh, that is co-sponsored by Skynet and Stacks. Um, so we want you guys to create a tutorial that shows developers how to um, use Skynet and use Clarity together to make an application that blends the two technologies. Um, and so the grand prize for this tutorial is $2,000. The best tutorial that gets submitted gets $2,000 in cash. Um, and then all tutorials that are um, good that, you know, if, if the grand prize winner hadn't been there, uh, it would have been counted as good enough, they will receive a participation prize of $200. So you do not have to worry about walking home empty handed because someone else blew you out of the park. Uh, if you make a passable tutorial, uh, you'll get $200. So I believe that's all the time I have. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today.